Hello and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Coming up on our program, foreign workers and H-1B visas. President Trump clamps down and orders a full review. We take a closer look at the impact on Bay Area tech companies. Plus, the lone Republican, attorney and venture capitalist John Cox, is the only Republican so far to declare he's running for governor. We'll talk with him about why he wants the state's top job. And reflections on civil disobedience. A Bay Area activist who's made protesting her life's work is now the subject of a new film. But first, we turn our attention to Berkeley, where a pro-Trump rally that included white nationalists turned violent last weekend. Several people were injured and at least 20 were arrested. The university town has been the scene of intense political clashes in recent months, so much so that on Wednesday, UC Berkeley canceled the appearance of right-wing pundit Ann Coulter out of safety concerns. A day later, the university reversed itself and invited Coulter back. Joining me now to talk about this further is Francis Dinkelspiel, co-founder of the local news site BerkeleySide.com. Francis, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. All right, there's been a flurry of activity in the last 24 hours. Bring us up to speed. What are the details of UC Berkeley's new proposal, and how are Ann Coulter and the Berkeley College Republicans reacting to that, that, that group being the group that invited her? Well, uh, the university extended a sort of an olive branch of some sort to Coulter and the College Republicans saying, look, we can't accommodate you April 27th, but we'll accommodate you May 2nd. Uh, well, it turns out that that date is not um, available, supposedly, to Ann Coulter, and she's not very happy that it's in the middle of dead week when no students are in classes. So this morning, she's been tweeting that she's not coming to Berkeley on May 2nd, but she's still going to show up on April 27th. Uh, and the Berkeley College Republicans are now being represented by San Francisco attorney Harmeet Dillon. And in a letter to the university, Dillon is demanding that culture speech be allowed to take place next Thursday as originally scheduled and that a centrally located venue be provided during evening hours. She also wrote this to the university. It is ironic that UC Berkeley, known to many Americans as the birthplace of the free speech movement, is now leading the vanguard to silence conservative speech on campus. What are your thoughts on how the university is handling all this? Well, I, I, you know, I think the university has found itself in a very difficult spot. Uh, I think the university believes in free speech. I think under most circumstances, they would be happy to accommodate Ann Coulter. But it's very important to realize that since February 1st, there have been three violent rallies in Berkeley where people have come with sticks and M80s, which is a form of firecrackers, and, uh, you know, bats and knives, and they've beat people, they beat themselves up and beat other people up on the streets of Berkeley. And so the same Supreme Court decision that guarantees uh, freedom of speech on university campuses also says if there is a real threat of violence, um, a public institution has the right not to guarantee uh, that freedom of speech. And so I think that's what the university is relying on. Of course, it gives them a big black eye. They don't look great, but I think they are truly concerned about what's going to happen when Ann Coulter speaks. And in fact, the university officials have said that, that they, they did not cancel Coulter's speech initially because of her views, but rather because of safety concerns. All the violent protests that you have just mentioned in Berkeley, in a recent article, you said that you feel Berkeley is now becoming the ground zero of a new civil war. Um, can you expand on that? Yes. Yeah, so the big rally on April 15th that took place in a park in central Berkeley um, was very different, I think, in tone uh, and scope of, of other demonstrations. I mean, Berkeley is the heart, heart, you know, there are demonstrations in Berkeley all the time. But this one was really different. It wasn't demonstrators protesting against the United States government or the state of California or the university. It was uh, people beating up people. It was citizens against citizens. And I've been in the news business for a really long time. I've never seen that before. It felt like a civil war on the streets of Berkeley, mm. and it was very disturbing. Well, and in, in, in addition to this latest controversy, of course, we have the violence in February, which you alluded to. Mm -hmm. That had to do with a scheduled appearance by Milo Yiannopoulos. Um, that, and coupled with what is happening now, what are the what are what's the impact of these incidents on the legacy of UC Berkeley as a bastion of free speech? Well, um, uh, I, I think the university is, you know, in an awkward position as as I mentioned earlier. I mean, I think that uh, free speech 
today and the way it's being used by some of these right-wing groups and some of these left-wing groups is almost developing a new definition. I mean, the United States is alone among many developed countries that it allows hate speech. Uh, France does not allow hate speech. Germany does not allow hate speech. In the United States, you know, people are allowed to say whatever they want. Now there's a groundswell of movement um, by, you know, these anti-fascists that are saying, no, hate speech is destructive. Hate speech is not innocent, and we're not going to let it happen. And so um, I think, unfortunately, for Berkeley and for UC Berkeley, uh, that's, it, that it's happening in Berkeley, and that is something that's going to have, you know, longstanding implications. And I don't think we quite know what those implications are. But if you don't allow some of those people to have their say, and this is something Robert Reich, the former labor secretary mm -hmm. who now teaches at UC Berkeley, has said. He said, if you don't allow people to have their say, even people like Ann Coulter, whom you may not disagree, who, whom you may not agree with, how will students know what her views are and have the opportunity to question her, challenge her, and make up their own minds? I think that's an excellent point. I mean, I think that it's very important to allow people in the United States to say what they believe. That's one of the rocks and, of, you know, one of the foundations of our Constitution. However, um, you, you know, you can't look at that in a vacuum. You can't say, yes, free speech has to happen under every circumstances, uh, because if that person arriving on a UC Berkeley campus is going to cause, uh, or not cause, is going to sort of incite riots, or is going to have people drawn to her or or him, and they're going to be beating one another up outside the speech. That raises really important questions. All right. So in the 30 seconds or so we have remaining, what can we do at this point then to? try to stop this cycle of violent protests and stop Berkeley from being the ground zero of a new civil war, as you call it. Yeah, I, I'm not very optimistic that there is a solution because I don't think that the radicals on the right or the left are interested in allowing free speech or they're not interested in creating a good dialogue. So long as there is that, uh, that attitude, I don't think this is going to stop. And mm -hmm. so I think, uh, you know, for the foreseeable future, we're going to have a lot of action on the streets of Berkeley. All right, Francis Dinklespiel with BerkeleySide.com. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Now to our ongoing coverage of President Trump's first 100 days. This week, one of the executive orders President Trump signed calls on the Department of Homeland Security to review the way H-1B visas are given out. The H-1B visa program allows American companies to hire foreign workers for high-skilled jobs as long as they cannot be filled in the U.S. But critics contend there's widespread abuse, with foreigners replacing American workers, often for less pay. Joining me now is BuzzFeed senior technology writer Natasha Tiku. Natasha, welcome. Thanks for having me. So how are Bay Area high tech companies responding to this latest executive order on H-1B visas? I think they're responding with a little bit of a wait and see attitude, which is the same way they've been towards the Trump administration. Like you said, uh, Trump is asking the Department of Homeland Security and Department of Labor for feedback about the process. So it's not quite sure how it will play out, you know, like compared to the rhetoric about it, uh, you know, where he said, buy American, hire American, and that he wants to kind of do away with the program. It's not clear that he will actually have that much impact. So I think they want to stay on his good side right now. So let's say, hypothetically, if the Department of Homeland Security reviews this, decides on even more stringent restrictions, which companies will benefit from H-1B reform and which stand to lose the most? Um, you know, I think that because uh, part of the reform that they suggested is uh, rather than having a lottery system, uh, which privileges um, contracting companies like Tata and Infosys, which kind of flood, flood the zone with a ton of applications and so therefore end up getting more, more workers' visas. Those uh, are outsourcing companies Yes, primarily. outsourcing companies. And those have been you know, called out specifically by Trump and the Trump administration as like people, uh, institutions that they want to cut out of the process. So in that case, uh, companies like Facebook, uh, which 15% of its American workforce is on H-1Bs, might benefit because they pay higher salaries. And uh, you know, if they can make an argument that these are genuinely high-skilled workers that are that are getting better uh, payment, um, you know, they should they should be winning the visas. But that also means that Facebook has to pay them more. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, everything is kind of a mixed bag right now. Well, President Trump has said repeatedly that there's abuse in the H-1B program. Um, is there a lot of abuse going on? 
Yes, I, I mean, with the with these contract, these outsourcing companies, mm -hmm. it's true they have found a way to game the system. I, I don't know if it's necessarily abuse if they're if it's you know allowed by the by the restrictions that exist. But uh, the other side of of the other downside of the program is the fact that the workers who come over here they are limited in their options. Uh, you know they can't negotiate. They they have to stay with the company that sponsored them, and so tech companies are able to pay them less. Mm. Um, you know, so it's not even necessarily that they're replacing American workers. It's partly that they can be, you know, they are uh, kind of stuck in their position and they can be more affordable for the company. So what does it take to get an H-1B visa? What, what kinds of education and skills do you need? So you need at least a bachelor's degree and it's supposed to be, it's an employment-based visa um, for highly skilled workers. And usually that applies to biotech, chemistry, um, law, accounting, those types of professions. And if you have a more advanced degree, even like a master's degree or PhD, you're not, uh, you don't have to abide by the cap in the number of H-1B visas. And, and just a quick note on this, this year 199,000 H-1B visa applications were received. That's actually down mm -hmm. from 236,000 the previous year. So why the drop? Um, I mean, I think they've been listening to President Trump and they hear that, uh, you know, workers who came here for a better opportunity, um, even if they're not, you know, paid as much as their American colleagues, it's a wonderful opportunity to work for these Silicon Valley firms. And when they know that they're not wanted, um, especially because it had been kind of a privileged mm -hmm. status, like if you, you know, if you're going to get an employment based visa, like H-1B is pretty great. You can bring your dependents, you can bring your family and your wife and your husband. Uh, so if they hear that they're not really wanted, you know, they can look somewhere else. Yeah. All right, and before we let you go, I have to ask you about this on a somewhat related note. Sure. Some Silicon Valley companies are now offering uh, workers paid time off to mm -hmm. attend protests, including an upcoming one on uh, pro-immigration right. uh, on May 1st. Which companies are doing this? Well, Facebook notably is doing this, and I, I think it's very interesting because they were not the most vocal in terms of letting their companies, uh, letting their employees and, and having executives protest Trump's initial immigration orders. You know, we saw like the CEO of Google and uh, one of the co-founders of Google out at the airports protesting, and uh, Facebook, now they have a chance to, you know, remake themselves as supportive. Okay, well, we'll see if it, uh, how it shakes out for them. Yeah. All right, Natasha Tiku with BuzzFeed. Thank Thanks you very much. Me. The last time a Republican won a statewide election in California was 2006. But that's not stopping one Southern California venture capitalist from trying. Attorney John Cox is the only Republican so far to announce he's running to replace termed out Governor Jerry Brown next year. Cox ran for political office in his native Illinois, but did not win. He's running for governor here, he says, to clean up government. He sat down to talk with KQED senior editor for politics and government, Scott Schaefer. John Cox, welcome to KQED Newsroom. Thanks for coming in. Thank you for having me, Scott. At this point, as we sit here, you are not yet a household name in California. No, uh, you are a CPA, you're an attorney, you're a venture capitalist, a businessman. What are you offering that California needs? Political reform. We've got a system that rewards the funders of campaigns that basically allows the funders of campaigns to dictate what happens in Sacramento. Uh, the result is that we've got a state that uh, is, has one of the worst business climates in the country, uh, has the highest income and sales tax rates, now one of the biggest gas tax rates. Uh, it's almost becoming unaffordable for middle class people. When you say political reform, what does that mean? That means we need to change a system that really uh, allows uh, a corruptive, uh, the corruptive influence of, of special interest money to really dictate what happens in Sacramento. And, and the voters know it. I mean, we, we've done the polling, uh, and 90% and of the people believe that special interest money is the driving force behind just about everything that happens in Sacramento. Forgive me, though, because that's something that many elected officials talk about, cleaning up the system. Well, they Bernie talk. Sanders talked about. So what makes you think John Cox, uh, with a Democrat-controlled legislature, two-thirds majorities in both houses, that you, as governor, as a Republican, could, could do the job? Because we're going to get a new legislature that's going to be immune to the funding uh, of, of these special interests. Uh, it's, it's similar to what's being done in New Hampshire right now. New Hampshire is a very small state, uh, obviously, but it has these little, tiny, little micro districts. And, and real people run for office, and they do it by getting to know their neighbors and, and talking to them on their doorstep. 
So I went to the top lawyers and the top political scientists in California, and we've devised a plan, a system that's very much like the New Hampshire system, but is adapted to a state, obviously, so much larger like California, and it works. You're talking about this neighborhood legislature yeah. idea that you want to put on the ballot. It would carve up existing districts into much, much smaller districts. Is that yeah, what it would do? Yeah, it, it makes every single district uh, only five or 10,000 people so that real people can run, and they don't need any money to do it, so they won't be professional fundraisers like the people in Sacramento. That sounds good, but on the other hand, you're talking about a legislature that would be, what, almost 100 times as big? But we devised... Is that right? Is that right? It, we do, but it divide, we devised a special system called a working committee that allows still only 120 people in Sacramento to do all yeah. the legislative work, but they're responsive to the people out in the neighborhoods yeah. who are elected the neighborhoods. You've run for office three times in Illinois. You ran for the Senate. I think you ran for uh, Congress. You ran for the Cook County uh, deed recorder. You lost all those races. Uh, and you've also pushed the ballot measure you described and also another one to require legislators to put logos on their shirts and jackets uh, saying who their campaign donors are. What would you say to someone who hears all that and thinks, well, he's just kind of a, a rich guy, kind of a political dilettante? No, I, I'm not a dilettante at all. I, I'm, a, I'm a political disruptor. Uh, I, I guess that's the term that's used now, especially in the Bay Area here. But I spent my life, you know, I, I grew up on the south side of Chicago uh, with a mom who taught in the Chicago public schools, and I saw firsthand the corruption. So if there's one theme in my life, Scott, is that I abhor political corruption. I've always worked against the corrupt interest, which may in fact be what I lost those races, uh, because the corrupt interests are very powerful. powerful. Very They're very powerful. powerful. So I'm not giving up. And I think this now, this neighborhood legislature, which I've been working on for seven years, is really the is really the tool that we're going to use to clean up uh, Sacramento. So we haven't had a Republican win statewide, I think, since 2006. Uh, and Donald Trump, uh, very unpopular in California. So I have to ask, did you, you're a Republican, did you vote for Donald Trump? Well, you know, I'm singularly focused on this legislative idea. Uh, I will say that California has more than its share of Republican governors, you know. Well, let, me, let me just stop you, because the question is, did you vote for Trump? And are you saying that you don't I, want I'm to not, say? I'm not, I'm not really going to get into the wars over Donald Trump. And, and frankly, it's kind of dumb for California to be at war with Washington. I'm glad he's president. Uh, I think Hillary Clinton, uh, you know, had a lot of faults. I think Donald Trump won. Uh, because he talked about cleaning the swamp. Uh, I'm gonna, he's got all these billionaires in his cabinet. Uh, I understand, you know, and, and that's the problem. See, Scott, I'm going to run for governor. I'm not going to ask people to trust me. I'm going to ask people to believe in a plan that I have, a structure with this neighborhood legislature that's going to allow us to finally elect people that represent us and not the special interests. And, uh, and I think the people of California will, will warm to that idea. And uh, that's why I started early, to get this going. Just real quick, if I can get some of your positions, kind of a yes or no sort of on some things. Uh, do you support a woman's right to abortion? Well, I am going to focus not on the social issues. Uh, if anybody wants to look me up, they can see where I've stood. I, I, well, I'm, why don't you just say, though? Well, because I want this to be all about the neighborhood legislature and getting an end to the corruption. And so... But if that's an issue that's important to someone, because, you know, the governor appoints a lot of judges, but for I, example. I won't have anything to do with it, because it's decided by the Supreme Court. Uh, so, you know, it, these issues, the social issues, guns, I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment, I'm pro-life, I'll, 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 I'll talk about those. But I want the focus of this to be on getting California to be in a sustainable position for the future financially, as well as cost-wise, as well as job-wise, uh, you know, to, to produce the jobs that we need to, to, to allow people to have a future in this state. Do you support Donald Trump's uh, idea of building a wall at the Mexican border? You know, I think the immigration issue is one that we have to deal with. Uh, again, I'd like to see it built uh, with a consensus, with a, a legislature that's representing the people and we build a but consensus. But you think it's a good idea, generally? No. I, I, well, I think we ought to enforce the law. I think we ought to uh, deport people who have broken the law. I think we need to have a, a, a robust uh, defense of the law. And I, and I think a, fa a wall has done well for San Diego in certain populous areas where it's, it's needed. All right. John Cox, Republican running for governor of California. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Remember this scene from last January? Greenpeace activists scaled a crane near the White House to unfurl a huge banner with just one word, resist. 
One of those activists was San Francisco resident Karen Topakian, a veteran of nonviolent protests. She's now the subject of a new film titled Arrested Again. It's playing this weekend at the Green Film Fest in San Francisco. Here's a clip about all the times Topakian's been arrested while engaging in civil disobedience. 2000, time to start getting arrested again because we're invading another country. So 2001, two, three, four, five, six, 2007, eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, and twice in 2016. I've been arrested 32 times in five states on coast, two coasts. And joining me now is the activist in person herself, Karen Topakian, as well as filmmaker Dan Goldies. Thank you both for being here. Mm -hmm. Well, Karen, the Resist Banner protest took uh, place really just one day after President Trump signed orders intended to restart construction of two oil pipelines, including Keystone. Were you just protesting that or other issues as well? No, we were protesting all of his policies, promises, and his practices. And it just was fortuitous that it happened the day after that. But everything about his administration Administration, we were encouraging people to resist. And this weekend, we have Earth Day. We have the March for Science happening in D.C. and also satellite marches around the Bay Area. Are, are the acts of civil disobe disobedience you're seeing now, are they different from what you've seen in recent years? You've been protesting for a long time. Are the people involved different? Do they play out different in cities across America? I would say that there has been many... Civil disobedience happens all the time in this country, and people use very similar tactics, but there's been more of it and an escalation now because the risks are much greater. We see, I see, that this administration has a great threat to our democracy and our planet, and I think with that, people are feeling the urgency of taking that next step beyond a protest, beyond a call into their senator to actually putting their bodies on the line and risking arrest. John, why did you decide to make this film? Dan, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, I made this film because Karen is such a great spokesperson for getting involved and doing what you believe in. And that was clear to me from the very first moment that I met her and, and heard her talking about all of these arrests. She approaches this in a really, really thoughtful way. Um, she engages in these protests uh, very deliberately and, and doesn't do it on a whim. And so that attracted me to, to her process. And speaking of that deliberate process, you talk about it in the film. Uh, you talk passionately about what you go through. What's your mindset as you prepare for a protest? So let's take a look at that. Okay. When I'm preparing for um, a direct action to, to commit an act of civil disobedience, I think about the young students at the lunch counter in North Carolina and how they were beaten. I think about the people who tried to register people to vote and the violence that ensued. The people who went to vote, just tried to exercise their right to vote. And then I think about my own family. I think about my grandfathers in Armenia, who when the Turkish military decided to conscript Christians, knew they couldn't stay in their country. And Karen, you were clearly so moved as you were talking there. What are you afraid will happen if you do not engage in civil disobedience? I fear that this administration will feel normal to people. I feel that people will be complacent. They will sit back on their sofa and they will let these egregious acts go by. They will let the quote unquote Muslim ban continue. They will allow the gutting of the EPA. They will allow all of these things that we have fought for decades to fight for women's right for reproductive rights and reproductive justice. I feel like all of those things we can lose unless we are out on the streets doing these things and we're demanding that we not. And we see that they work. Nonviolent direct action is the basis for how we have the human rights that we have in this country. And many of our other rights happen because people took to the streets and were willing to take that risk. It's funny, it feels like We've, we've gone back in so many ways. We're going back to battles that have been fought before. And so let's use the, the protest methods that worked so well before and, and, and re reintroduce them. Is that what resonated the most for you in the making of this film? Absolutely. I mean, I've been through uh, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, the gay rights movement, and that all those changes all happened because people got involved. People weren't afraid to sit back. And I'm, with Karen, I'm a little concerned that people confuse social media with actual activism. True. And that can be a problem. But, uh, she's willing to get out and do it. But you're no stranger to social media. In Not fact, let's all. go back to that crane <laughs> protest because you actually did a Facebook Live broadcast from there. And we have a clip from that as well. Let's show that. 
he's going to kind of get sick of us. And I actually hope he starts tweeting about us just to prove that we've gotten under his skin. So right now I'm asking you, what are you going to do today to resist? So even though Dan says social media is not a replacement for civil disobedience, you're clearly using it. How has social media changed civil disobedience? Well, I think what it's done is it's shown people that they're not alone. We live in the Bay Area or in a bubble. I know that probably nine out of 10 people share similar political values and thoughts that I have. But there are people who live around the world who don't live in those places and live in places where there are repressive regimes where it is impossible for them to articulate their what we would consider our First Amendment rights. Social media shows them they have a community of support and shows them that they are not alone and, in many cases, that they're not crazy. And if they don't have family or friends whom they can share these ideas with, there's a whole world of people they can share the ideas with. But it doesn't substitute for getting up and going out. And we've seen it with the marches, with the Women's March was huge. I was in Washington for that. I've never seen that many people on the street. It shows people are willing to do it if the stakes are high enough, and but, they're high. But not everyone agrees with what you're doing. I mean, Absolutely. Certainly there are those out there who say President Trump mm. was elected in a democratic country. This is democracy at work. And in fact, some have taken issue with the way you protest. For example, the crane mm -hmm. protest. They have said it was dangerous, illegal, shameful. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, um, it was the only way it would have been dangerous is if someone tried to mess with the people who are up on the crane and affect them or myself and another individual who are on the ladder blockading. That would have made it dangerous. What we did ourselves was not dangerous. Shameful, no. It's our First Amendment right. Our four, four parents fought for us to have the First Amendment right to express ourselves, and that is what I'm doing, is I am using that. And I have the right to petition my government, and this is how I'm choosing to do it. Okay, Dan, and real quickly, the uh, film is showing this weekend? Yes, world premiere at the San Francisco Green Film Festival at the Roxy this Sunday the 23rd at 12.30 p.m. All right, well, thank you both for being here, Karen Topakian and Dan Goldies. Thank, thank you. you. And that is it for us for tonight. For more of our coverage, go to kqed.org newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. Thank you so much for watching.